uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. Um, my topic uh, will be new evolutions uh, for the new adjuvant and adjuvant treatment of esophageal cancer. And actually, I will focus more on the neoadjuvant part because adjuvant is not such an important issue uh, in esophageal cancer, and there is not so much news about it. And uh, let me start uh, by showing you uh, the current ESMO guidelines, uh, which I had uh, the pleasure uh, to write together with Christophe Mayette and other colleagues. And this is showing you the main picture from these guidelines. And first of all, I would like to stress that uh, a very sophisticated staging is really the basis uh, for all the decisions that we have to take. Uh, please be aware that most of the important decisions we have to take are based on the clinical stagings. Uh, so this suite's really a good quality, multi-slice CT, FDG PET uh, is included uh, in the European guidelines, and also, of course, a good endoscopy, a good endoscopic ultrasound. And uh, this is something uh, which is uh, really crucial. And I also want to make you aware that in these guidelines, uh, we clearly distinguish between adenocarcinoma and squamous cell cancer. And I think it is important to do that because uh, often these things are much generalized. And even in the studies, uh, these two histological subtypes are put together. And uh, we think that uh, this is uh, not justified because there are important differences between adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. Uh, regarding epidemiology and risk factors, tumor location, comorbidities of the patients, their survival outcomes, and maybe most importantly, also biology. And uh, this is something we are learning more and more here from a paper from 2017 from the recent TCGA analysis that really tumor location is very, very much associated uh, with tumor biology, with uh, the squamous cell subtype being localized often in the proximal and mid-esophagus and adenocarcinoma in the distal esophagus and some more distinctions when you go further down. And there is just one picture which I want uh, to show you from this publication. And um, in, uh, in short words, uh, it tells us that esophageal squamous cell cancer really has very comparable molecular um, similarity um, with head and neck squamous cell cancer, why adenocarcinoma of the esophagus is very similar to the SYN type, to the chromosomal instable subtype of gastric cancer. So uh, this is uh, just to, to set the scene, and uh, we will also talk uh, a lot about EG junction cancers, and I simply want to make you aware once again of the Sievert classification, which says that type one is the true esophageal adenocarcinoma, uh, mostly located in the distal parts of the esophagus. Uh, type 2 is the true cardiac cancer, and type 3 is a subcardial gastric cancer which infiltrates the cardia from below. And in the current classification, in the eighth edition of the UICC TNM classification, AEG type 1 and type, type 2 are classified as esophageal cancers, while AEG type 3 is classified as gastric, as gastric cancer. And when you remember the biology I showed you before, um, this comes probably closer uh, to what is true, that the subcardial cancers are already gastric cancers infiltrating uh, the cardia from below. Uh, so, uh, what about the agenda? What do I want uh, to discuss in the next 15 minutes? I want to discuss the current developments of chemo versus radiochemo for adenocarcinoma. The question, is surgery needed for esophageal squamous cell carcinoma? The role for novel drug regimens, epirubicin, taxanes, targeted treatments, immunotherapy. And last but not least, I want to focus uh, shortly on response-adapted treatment algorithms. So let us come uh, to the um, often discussed topic, should we use perioperative, preoperative chemotherapy alone or combine with radiation for adenocarcinoma of the esophagus and ED junction? And you can see here in the European guidelines that we recommend both approaches. Both approaches are evidence-based. You can go for perioperative uh, chemotherapy, but also for neoadjuvant uh, chemoradiation. And 
in both situations, resection, esophagectomy, is part of the standard procedure in adenocarcinomas. Why is this the case? Because neoadjuvant chemotherapy has been shown to be effective in meta-analysis, and the OE2 study is the landmark study that has to be mentioned here. But also, new adjuvant chemoradiation has been shown to be effective in meta-analysis, and the cross-trial, carbotaxol and radiation, is the landmark study that has to be mentioned here. There are very few direct comparisons of uh, chemotherapy versus chemoradiation uh, in esophageal adenocarcinoma. I show you the direct comparisons that have been made. There is one older study from Germany, which is called the POET study, and this study compared two non-standard regimens, I would say, a very long period of uh, preoperative chemotherapy of 17 weeks compared to chemo followed by chemoradiation, both arms followed by surgery, and Michael Stahl in this year uh, has published uh, the long-term follow-ups of uh, this comparison, which shows an advantage advantage, uh, a borderline advantage uh, for the chemoradiation arm, but look at the survival curves. Survival is really poor uh, for this um, adenocarcinoma population, so probably uh, the study has selected a, a difficult patient population. It's just an interesting observation of note. Local progression-free survival, which means local control, was better with the addition of radiation therapy. But there is another study which has also been published by end of last year, which comes from Scandinavia, Swedish-Norwegian uh, cooperation, and they compared two standard regimens, neoadjuvant chemotherapy or chemoradiation. The majority of the patients who have been enrolled had adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. And as you can simply see here on the Kaplan-Meier survival curves, there was no difference at all uh, in this 180 phase two randomized uh, controlled study. So it's difficult to say at the current time point what is better, if chemotherapy or chemoradiation. Uh, there is also an interesting uh, propensity score matched analysis uh, from the Dutch colleagues recently published in Surgical Oncology. And they compared patients who had received perioperative ECF compared to patients who had received neoadjuvant cross. It's not a randomized study, it's a propensity score matched analysis from big centers in the Netherlands. And again, they do not show a survival uh, difference for any of these two approaches. Now, keeping in mind that recently the FLOT study has showed that FLOT is better than ECF, you might uh, consider that uh, maybe FLOT uh, could even be better than cross. And so this is an interesting hypothesis, uh, which we are currently studying in Germany in the ESOPEC study. And we have put here neoadjuvant chemoradiation according to the cross regimen, carbo uh, carboplatin, paclitaxel, and radiation as a standard arm compared to perioperative FLOT with the hypothesis that perioperative FLOT is superior in terms of the three-year overall survival rate. So this is an ongoing study uh, which currently recruits patients. Let me switch to the next topic, which I will make a little bit shorter. It's surgery versus definitive chemoradiation for esophageal squamous cell cancer. And again, I'm getting back here to the ESMO guidelines, uh, where you can see that for squamous cell cancers, we recommended both approaches. The one is neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy, followed uh, by planned esophagectomy, the other recommended approach is definitive chemoradiotherapy. Why is this the case? Because two prospective randomized control trials, one performed in France, another one performed in Germany, showed similar survival outcomes for both approaches. Uh, again, probably uh, with a better local tumor control rate for patients who underwent surgery, uh, but no survival advantage with the addition of surgery to chemoradiation. Um, something is new here in the guidelines, which you will probably not find in other international guidelines, and it's the addition of uh, salvage uh, resection. 
in patients who fail on definitive uh, chemo radiation. And why did we feel that this could be included? This is uh, uh, based on uh, work of uh, some groups, especially of the group of uh, Christoph Mayet and co-workers. And they published recently in, uh, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology a comparison of salvage surgery versus neoadjuvant chemo radiation followed by planned surgery. Uh, they looked at this population uh, and they did a propensity score matching, so ended up with 300 patients with salvage versus 308 patients uh, with planned surgery. And this analysis uh, allowed also to compare the prognosis of patients with persistent disease following neoadjuvant chemo definitive chemoradiation or recurrent disease. And uh, this study shows some interesting findings. In-hospital mortality was not increased with salvage surgery, which was a bit of a surprise because in the past we always thought that this is a very risky procedure. Uh, of note, the anastomotic leak rate was higher uh, in the salvage surgery arm, but three-year overall survival and three-year disease-free survival were not different. And you can see here the overall survival curves comparing salvage surgery and planned surgery. But there are also uh, other aspects uh, which are worth to be mentioned. Uh, the persistent uh, tumor group had a worse uh, survival than those who presented with recurrent disease. I would say this was expected, but it is important to note that there was a very high mortality in low volume centers and also a very high mortality for patients who had undergone a definitive chemoradiation with more than 55 grays. So this means if you go for salvage surgery, this is really a procedure for very experienced centers where from the surgeon to the multidisciplinary team, everybody knows what to do and has a high expertise. I think this is very important to say at this stage. Um, this salvage surgery approach is now brought uh, into, um, uh, into subsequent studies. I will not go into details here. There is one interesting study currently run in the Netherlands, which has uh, the aim to define how to select esophageal squamous cell cancer patients for a watch and wait strategy. And there are different studies now starting worldwide. So let me switch uh, to the topic of novel drugs and novel regimens. Uh, what about apirubicin, taxanes, targeted therapies, and immunotherapy? Uh, let us talk about apirubicin first, and this is time to mention the OE5 study, which compared the OE2 standard, uh, which consists of two cycles of cisplatin 5-EFU versus four cycles of cisplatin and, uh, and uh, cape cytopine complemented by epirubicin. This was done in esophageal adenocarcinoma type 1 and type 2 according to Sievert. So the expectation, of course, was that with the addition of epirubicin as a, f uh, as a third drug and with the prolongation uh, of uh, chemotherapy, uh, you might achieve uh, better survival outcomes. But this, unfortunately, was not the case. The survival curves are exactly uh, the same. Uh, so we can conclude that in this setting, there is no more role for epirubicin. It is not needed. It only adds toxicity. And there is not also no reason to prolong uh, preoperative uh, chemotherapy from 6 to 12 weeks, like it has been done in OE5. Uh, later this day, uh, you will hear in details results uh, from the FLOT study, which is a randomized multicenter phase 2-3 study um, presented at ASCO this year that was uh, done in Germany, comparing four cycles of FLOT pre-op and post-op with three cycles of ECF or ECX pre-op and post-op. Um, importantly, 23% of the included uh, patients had Sievert type 1 adenocarcinoma and 33 had Sievert type 2 or 3 adenocarcinoma. So this study is also quite valid uh, for the topic of esophageal adenocarcinoma. And uh, as some of you know, and others uh, will see later in the day uh, in the presentation of Sala Albatran, this study showed a survival advantage for FLOT with a difference after three years of 9%, which is certainly clinically relevant. Um, 
just shortly to talk about anti-angiogenic treatment, the STO3 study was recently published uh, by David Cunningham in the Lancet Oncology. The addition of uh, bevacizumab uh, to ECF or ECX here in gastric cancer, including EG junction cancers, uh, did not lead to a survival benefit. And it is important to note that there was an increase of anastomotic leaks in patients undergoing esophagectomy. So certainly in the future, uh, implementing anti-angiogenic drugs in esophageal cancer patients who need uh, esophagectomy is not a good idea and will not probably not be done anymore. Uh, what about anti-EGFR targeting agents? There are conflicting results. Here is uh, one uh, relatively big study from North America where cetuximab was added to carbiplatin, paclitaxel, and uh, radiotherapy in the preoperative setting with no survival differences. Uh, there were other results uh, shown by a Swiss-German group this year at ESCO uh, where the addition of cetuximab to cisplatin, docetaxel, and radiotherapy um, showed a survival difference. So this is uh, difficult um, to, to make a firm conclusion. Uh, my impression is that there is not a clear future for anti-EGFR targeted agents, maybe in subgroups which still need to be defined, but currently there are more negative results than positive results, but uh, it's not really clear yet. And there are several interesting ongoing studies on anti-HER2 targeting agents, and we speak here about trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Uh, first and foremost, there is uh, the global ERTC 1203 innovation study, uh, which compares chemotherapy. We are currently amending to a flot and falfox plus minus trastuzumab in one arm or plus minus trastuzumab and pertuzumab. A very similar study is run in Germany uh, which, uh, with uh, just the combination of trastuzumab and pertuzumab, no trastuzumab alone arm. And another study is running in Northern America with carboplatin, paclitaxel, and uh, radiotherapy plus minus trastuzumab. Of course, all these studies are selected for her to positive patients. Uh, also important to mention the current approaches concerning immunotherapy. Uh, you see I'm showing a lot of studies here. I cannot go into details uh, just to show you there are approaches with adjuvant nivolumab in patients following neoadjuvant chemoradiation and surgery in esophageal cancer. Uh, there are gastric cancer studies uh, including EG junction cancers adding pembrolizumab uh, to uh, standard chemotherapy uh, there is uh, the preparation of an ERTC study which will add nivolumab and ipilimumab in patients coming from neoadjuvant chemotherapy who present with high-risk features like positive nodal status or R1 resection. And uh, there is another perioperative study adding atezolizumab to FLOT in gastric and EG junction cancers. So there is a lot of things ongoing and uh, we are curious to see these results. Let me now come to the last point. Uh, are there response-adapted treatment algorithms uh, which may play a role in the future? Many of uh, these considerations are based on the work of the previous uh, Munich uh, group, uh, which focused on early detection <coughs> of response and non-response, implementing early metabolic response assessment. The question here really was, can PET help to tailor preoperative treatment according to response? in esophageal and EG junction cancer patients. And it was clearly shown more than 10 years ago that early metabolic response measured by FDG-PET is a strong prognostic, prognostic discriminator with a better prognosis for metabolic responders compared to metabolic non-responders. Based on this knowledge, uh, we started uh, the Municon trials that included uh, ED junction cancer patients who underwent a baseline PET and a 14-day PET, and uh, the population was split into non-responders who proceeded with uh, immediate resection, interrupted their chemotherapy early, while the responders continued with preoperative chemotherapy until they underwent resection, and expectedly, uh, Municon 1 study also showed a difference uh, in terms of survival for PET responders, significantly better than PET non-responders. And interestingly, um, this difference uh, was comparable to the patients who went on with chemotherapy. And what we, uh, um, what we believe to show is that the interruption of preoperative chemotherapy in the non-responders does not deteriorate the prognosis or is even better for these patients than continuation with preoperative chemotherapy and, um, in the situation of non-response. 
Um, I just want uh, to highlight here that many uh, groups around the globe took up this approach. Uh, here is something that has been shown at the, this year's ESCO GI meeting in January in San Francisco, a study from North America that also implemented early PET um, screening or PET response evaluation to define the chemotherapy backbone with radiation. It's a complicated study and I will not go uh, into any result details. I just want to show you that this approach of uh, an imaging biomarker is uh, still studied by many groups. Here is also a similar or comparable approach from the Australian group who also used early PET scanning uh, to um, uh, dichotomize uh, the population into a response population which goes on with the same treatment and a non-response population uh, which undergoes uh, more experimental treatment. And uh, we are also trying in the ERTC network together with the Nordic group to take uh, the early PET response evaluation during induction chemotherapy to pre-select patients uh, for a neoadjuvant cross approach in esophageal squamous cell cancer or for a definitive chemoradiation approach. Uh, but this is really work which is still under consideration and we don't have funding yet. Uh, but just to show you the ideas which are currently discussed. So let me conclude, give you a summary and a brief outlook. Neoadjuvant treatment in esophageal cancer improves survival in stage two and three. There is a clear indication for T3, T4 resectable tumors, still maybe an unclear indication for the T2 tumors. Um, there are different standard recommendations for esophageal squamous cell cancer and adenocarcinoma with a clear role for chemoradiation in esophageal squamous cell cancer, neoadjuvant or definitive. Uh, there is a recommendation for chemoradiation or chemotherapy for adenocarcinoma. There is a confirmed role for taxanes in both histologies, if you think about the cross regimen and also now the flood regimen. Uh, the value of targeted agents and immunotherapy needs to be established and response assessment needs to be explored for individualization of treatment. I thank you very much for your kind attention.